hard not to get caught up in the energy and everything there. It really is like happy. I feel like part of the community. Yeah, and exactly. With its Big Ten school spirit, Indiana University seems far removed from the temptations and dangers of the big city. Roommates, their daughter fit right in and was busy studying for a career in the world of fashion. She's just bubbly and outgoing, and you just really instantly fall in love with her when you meet her. But what her parents only later came to learn from investigators is that Bloomington, like many college towns, has its dark side. With students describing rampant alcohol abuse and a thriving drug scene. Lauren Spear just vanished into thin air. She's 20 years old. Last seen walking south on Bloomington's College Avenue from 11th. Her apartment on 8th in College, just three blocks. Heel, an IU student who seemingly vanished. The picture of the pretty co-ed now taped to age-old trees. We're going to go up Hickory Ridge and do the same thing we did the last time. Her father, Robert. We'd like anyone who has seen her to please contact the Bloomington police immediately. Dad and mom flew in from New York Saturday, still stunned by the news. The search spans a massive expanse. They're searching here because they say they were told to. And police? They're focusing their search in the city of Bloomington. Lauren was likely out partying, last seen walking south on Bloomington's College Avenue from 11th, her apartment on 8th in College, just three blocks. Video shows she never arrived. How long are you all planning to stay out here to search? I don't know. A long pause from Dad. Lauren! Lauren! As the echoes of Mom's plea. It's critical that we uh, focus on finding Lauren. We're not going to stop. Uh, this is going to be an everyday affair. Uh, I will be here. Um, we will be, you know, working and doing whatever we have to do uh, to find Lauren and bring her home. I just cannot imagine what these people are going through. And that is an emotional plea from the father of a missing young woman. She is 21-year-old, 20-year-old, excuse me, Indiana University student Lauren Spire, and she has not been seen since last Friday. She left a friend's apartment in the early morning hours after a night of being out, started to walk home. She was barefoot, uh, according to the descriptions, and then she literally vanished. Her disappearance has smart, sparked a massive search and social media efforts as well to find her. Joining Joining us now on the phone is a man who has a tremendous amount of experience, unfortunately, uh, with these kinds of, of cases. Uh, and he joins me now, the host of America's Most Wanted, John Walsh. John, welcome. Good to have you here today. Thank you, Martha. What do you think of this case? What, what stands out in your mind when you hear some of these details? Well, unfortunately, I'm in Brazil. I'm hunting for a, a, a pedophile, an American pedophile. I'm here with the marshals and the diplomatic security service. So I wish that I was on the ground with Lauren's parents, Robert and Charlene. But this is a, a very disturbing case because this girl disappeared at 4.30 in the morning. She went out Thursday night and disappeared on her way home. And she's in a, she's in a place that she shouldn't be. And, uh, you know, time is of the essence. Always time is in the essence of the case of a missing girl. And uh, we, we need the media's help. We, the, the parents are, are there helping in the search, physically working on the search. The chief of uh, police in Bloomington, Michael Dekoff, uh, has reached out to the FBI and to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And, and we're, everyone is desperate to find out something. Somebody must know something about what happened to Laura because she's disappeared under the worst circumstances. Yeah, it, you know, and Lauren's mother saying for that one person who has the answer to that one person, uh, to this mystery and this puzzle, bring Lauren back, let us know where she is, take her to a hospital. Basically, they're pleading for her to be dropped off anywhere uh, in this situation, you know, and, and the, it tracks her. She went out uh, in town in the evening, you know, with some friends, then, then it tracks her going to a friend's house, according to the reports that I read, uh, and then she started walking home in the early hours in the morning, somewhere around 4 o'clock in the morning, but she never made it to her apartment building because the surveillance video at the apartment building does not show her entering that building. So they've narrowed down. It, it, you know, how helpful is that, John, that they've at least been able to narrow down that window? Well, that, that, that is somewhat helpful. 
And um, I'm hoping and praying, as everybody else is, that it, this isn't just a predator, an opportunistic predator, and that this turns out like a few cases. The odds that she's alive statistically are very slim, but we never give up hope. Last week, I talked to Elizabeth Smart, who was missing for eight months, and lots of people had given up on her, and she was found alive. And after eight years, she finally got justice, and her kidnapper, who kidnapped her right from her home, was finally sentenced to life without parole. He kept her for eight months. We're hoping that wherever Lauren is, that she's alive. The odds say that she probably isn't. They're, they're searching. They're doing what they have to do. They're doing parallel investigations. First, it's friends and family. They're talking to her boyfriend, who wasn't out there that night. They're talking to her friends. Um, he wasn't out with her that night. They're talking to him. They're talking to all of her friends. That's a normal, normal investigation. And now they're also looking at sex offenders in the area, convicted rapists, convicted level three sex offenders, because it may just have been a predator that sees the opportunity, right. saw her that night in a bar, saw her having a good time, and followed her home. So we're, but the problem is that there is so little to go on. Spearer. They say witnesses last saw the 20-year-old headed home barefoot and alone after a night of partying. That was nearly two weeks ago now. The latest images come from a security camera, according to the authorities. Here's one of them, which police say shows Lauren just hours before she disappeared. There are others they'd like you to see. See Steve Brown with, a, with that from our Midwest Bureau. They, they released photos of a, a pickup truck. What, what's the significance here? Security cameras in the same neighborhood that Spearer disappeared from was seen circling a block in that area. And police, after saying yesterday they didn't want to describe the vehicle, today released pictures of this particular vehicle. A pickup truck, four-door, short bed, a Chevy Silverado or Colorado with apparently some lettering on the door. Police don't say it's a suspect inside, but they do want to talk to a person or persons that were in the vehicle when the pictures were taken. Shep? Now, family members say they're still very hopeful that she's out there somewhere. Lauren Spears cell phone and keys were recovered shortly after she was reported missing in the same neighborhood she was last seen. So that image from the earlier uh, in this story of her on that security camera, that's the last known image. And family members at a news conference today say when they take a look at it, they see much more. I think if you look closely, at the content in this picture, you will see who Lauren is. Uh, she's a happy, smiling, beautiful young lady on her way out for the evening. Indiana University, 2011. Look at that. A man from New York took this video. He says he found a bunch of missing persons posters taped to trees. Police checked it out and they say the property owners put them up as Halloween decorations. On Facebook, the family of Lauren Spear writes, quote, We have seen the video comprised of many, many persons' posters, including Lauren's. I cannot comprehend what would compel someone to find this amusing or entertaining. Clearly, they are not a family member. And Blair Wallach is an Indiana University junior, and she's known Lauren since they were nine years old. So, girls, welcome. I know this is a very scary time for you guys, and we're very um, understanding of, of what you're going through. Uh, Becca, tell me a little bit about, you know, about her and, and the behavior, in terms of what you're hearing, you know, what surprises you, what doesn't surprise you in terms of what I, I just talked about with Mark. I mean, Lauren and I have been very close friends for a very long time. I've known her since seventh grade. I've grown up with her. And as everybody has said, she's very close with her family. She's constantly in contact with her cell phone. She's constantly in contact with me. She's constantly in contact with all of her other friends. She has a huge, huge circle of friends. And I just, I can't believe that we're here right now and that this is where we are and that this isn't normal behavior, obviously. And this isn't something that we could ever have expected. Um, she was at, and you go to Indiana University, Blair, yes. so you're familiar with the, the terrain here and the community and everything. Um, she was at Kilroy's, which is a bar that probably, very popular college bar, I imagine, yeah. right? It's curious that she left, she left her shoes and her cell phone at that bar. Yeah. Well, what do you make of that? Well, I know that they put sand on the ground for a beach party, so I'm assuming that's why her shoes were off. And her cell phone... I know she's wearing leggings. There isn't like pockets or anything to put her phone in. I'm sure she just put it down and 
left it when she left. Yeah. Surprising though that she would leave without her cell phone. I mean, you know, yeah. right? I mean, that, that she's that's... always on her cell phone, like Becca said. Yeah, and, and we know, you know, obviously there was drinking involved, and they were at this bar. So it, it, the biggest concern is where she went from there. She apparently went to this guy Corey Rossman's apartment. Went to her apartment first, is the way that they're they're saying it now. Yeah, and then back to his apartment in the middle of the night. Uh, and on the way to or from her bag, her purse was found uh, on that path to there. Thoughts about that? I don't really know because I wasn't there. Of but it's just, I know that's what she keeps her credit cards in and everything. It's her key case. That's the key to our apartment. Strange. It just doesn't make She's sense. She's been dating that the same guy for a couple of years. You do know him? Yes. Nice guy? Yes. Yeah. And, and Corey Rossman, this name that has come up and he's being questioned. Uh, he's not a person of interest at this point. He's being questioned because he did see her. Do you know him? Never met him. Never heard her mention him before? No. All right. Uh, and you're going out to, to help in the search. Uh, Eventually, yeah. I want to. Becca's yeah. going today. And you're going today. All right, girls, good luck. And we're, our hearts are, we're thinking about her. I can't imagine what you guys are going through. It's a very, very difficult situation. Police say there is an altercation on that video. And while it did not involve the missing girl, it did involve someone she was with, who now says he can't remember it. Time is becoming critical, but after a week of searching, police and volunteers refuse to give up, looking for any sign of 20-year-old fashion student Lauren Spear. Keep the faith and keep praying and just hope that we're going to find her soon and she's going to come home to the ones who love her most. An anonymous tip led police to nearby Lake Monroe. We'd have our dive team go down to Lake Monroe and take a look at, uh, at the area that was uh, described with negative results. Police have poured over surveillance videos taken at Spears' apartment building the night she vanished and are speaking to as many as 10 people described as persons of interest. According to police, the video shows an altercation about two hours before Lauren went missing. All of our information, including video and uh, uh, interviews, indicates that Lauren was not involved in any altercation. But Corey Rossman, the fellow Indiana University student Lauren was with, apparently was. He was basically, uh, he got his clock clean. Rossman's attorney, Carl Saltzman, says his client was hit hard in the face and now has no memory at all of what happened that night. The uh, injury to his head significantly affected his memory, not only from the time forward, but, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes prior to getting hit. Following the fight, Saltzman says Lauren assisted Rossman back to his apartment in this nearby building. She then reportedly spent time partying with other friends before heading home alone at 4.30 in the morning and disappearing. He's three, four, maybe even five people away from being the last person to see her. Lauren's mother and father, who are here from New York, continue to urge searchers not to give up hope. Anything small could be big. Saltzman says despite the head injury causing memory loss, his client did not seek medical attention. But he adds that Corey Rossman is cooperating. Investigator, thanks for being with us, Rod. Good morning. Patty. A quick check of the timeline. Thursday night, she goes to Kilroy Sports Bar. 2:30 in the right. morning, she leaves with Corey Rossman. Ten minutes later, arrives at her apartment building with him. There's a scuffle caught on tape between Corey and another man in that lobby. And so Corey and Lauren left. Never went up to her apartment. They go to Corey's building nearby. They visit multiple apartments in that building. At about 4:30, Corey's roommate Mike Betts says Corey goes to bed. Lauren leaves. She's last seen walking barefoot on the street three blocks from her apartment. Surveillance video does not show her arriving at her own building. Her keys, her coin purse found in an alley on the way home. Obviously something happened during that walk home. Foul play, do you believe? I believe it was foul play, but I can tell you that the police are operating right now off of three theories real quickly here, uh, Patty Ann. One, you know, is Lauren's disappearance the result of the altercation that took place that you just talked about with these other individuals? The police have not ruled that out completely yet. They have identified 10 persons of interest that were involved in that, but so far none of these people have panned out. 
The second theory that they're working off of is maybe Lauren was the victim of some sexual predator in that community. Now, there's well over 140 sexual predators living in that community there in Bloomington, so they are checking that out. As a matter of fact, the, I just read where the U.S. Marshal Service has gotten involved in this case, and they're looking at these sexual predators. And then the third theory, real quickly, is whether or not Lauren just could have walked away, maybe harmed herself, and she could be somewhere waiting on help to come. So one of those theories I think the police are going to really, really zero in on this week. Yeah, uh, Corey Rossman, this person who she was walking back and forth with, has hired a lawyer immediately. Uh, right. And the lawyer says that when Corey and Lauren arrived at that building, that there was that fight, Corey was punched in the face. And the lawyer claims that now Corey has no memory of anything else that happened that night. Fishy? You know, we call that convenient amnesia <laughs> in law enforcement. You know, why is it? Here's my question, Patty Ann. Why did this guy run out so quickly and lawyer up? Typically, as a homicide investigator or any investigator, when a person runs out quickly right after somebody is missing or harmed and get, a, and get an attorney, we always look at that person with some air of suspicion because that's a little bit unusual. Now, that doesn't necessarily in and of itself mean that Corey was involved, but it does raise the level of suspicion with him. And then why is it that he cannot remember something that just happened days ago? Yeah. Um, police are not giving details on who is or is not cooperating, but they do say, as you mentioned, there are 10 persons of interest. They say one of them is Corey. One of them is Corey's roommate, Mike Beth. Right. Another one is this other person who says he saw her leave the building. Also, uh, she has a boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, who That's she right. apparently was not with that night. Uh, they say that some of these people have not agreed yet to be interviewed by police and that police cannot compel them to come in and cooperate at this point. You know, Patty, and I find that to be the most interesting aspect so far of this case. Let me tell you why real quickly. The police chief made a statement yesterday, and I thought this was so interesting. He said to the people there that we cannot compel people to stay in town. If they want to leave town, they, can, they have the right to leave town. I'm thinking to myself, why did he make that statement? It's almost like he's saying there is someone or maybe a couple of people who have left the area. They have not cooperated. They have used the polygraph exam on certain people. But so far, like I said, that has not panned out. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, you've got the Texas Equisearch talking about getting involved, and they say they're hoping for a miracle, but in their own words, it doesn't look good at this point. Uh, one of the focuses was this Lake Monroe nearby. That's right. Police yep. apparently got some kind of, they call, very specific tip, but so far that hasn't panned out. What, uh, how, how does that play into this? Well, I can tell you that they got so far about 40 tips. I don't know if you know, but America's Most Wanted ran a segment Saturday night on right. this. And as a result of that segment, they got 40 tips in. You know, the normal course for an investigation like this is to check every tip out, see if it pans out. So far, nothing has panned out. But any information the police can get right now is definitely going to be helpful. So if any of our viewers know anything about... Harris is on it at the breaking news desk. Harris? Yeah, three things everybody should know about this case today. First, Lauren Spear has a dangerous heart condition, and she needs medication for it. So the clock is now ticking louder than ever before. She's been missing since vanishing after being at a sports bar with friends last Friday morning. So one week without her heart medication, that is one word that her family wants to get out. The other thing simply is her description. You can see her here, but some details on that. She's described as being petite, 4'11", less than 100 pounds. She left her cell phone and her shoes in that bar that she was with friends. Her keys were found a block away. That's the only trace that's been found of Lauren Spearer since last Friday. And now the tip line, 812-339-4477. has been tracking a reinvigorated investigation. Surveillance cameras... With the help of former FBI cold case agent Brad Garrett, now an ABC News consultant, retracing her every step. Last seen actually at this intersection. The last time she was seen alive is exactly where we're standing. I'm looking at him. Lauren Spear grew up in the New York City suburb of Scarsdale. What are you going to be? I'm going to be a princess. You're going to be a princess. She's a great kid, uh, high energy, very caring. Very caring. Loving. I love you. Her heartbroken mother and father, Charlene and Rob Spear, that made me cry, honey. Try now to smile through their tears as they remember the good times. The child ballerina. Mom and Dad, I just want to say thank you. I'm having an amazing night and I love you too so much. 
the coming of age at her bat mitzvah. We're proudest of how she handles herself, her boundless potential, and her joy in living life. Live knew something about her disappearance, but the three denied any wrongdoing and returned to school that fall to continue their education as the Spears' frustration continued to build. They refused to take a police polygraph, which we feel is important for a number of reasons, one of which is to help you know, narrow down the field of uh, people who really know what happened to her that night. Have passed since Lauren Spears' parents, Rob and Charlene, last heard their daughter's voice or enjoyed her smile. Lauren was like a very outgoing child. She loved to pretend. She loved to use different um, accents. The 20-year-old Indiana University sophomore disappeared June 3rd, 2011 after a night out with friends and fell back. No arrests, no suspects named. Police say they, quote, continue to pursue all avenues in this investigation. Mike Harkins retired from the FBI in 2012, his 22-year career focused on finding the missing. You have to be open to all, all theories here. I think, uh, you know, you, 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 take, you go where the evidence takes you, why don't we split up three and three? The and main theories of Lauren's disappearance are simple. Was she taken by a stranger? Or were the students last seen with her involved? Fellow students Corey Rossman, Mike Beth, and Jay Rosenbaum are among the last people to see Lauren alive. They have not been named suspects and maintain their innocence. Rossman claims he remembers little of what happened that night, but he did spend time with Lauren. According to witnesses, Lauren and Rossman walked from a popular bar to her apartment at 2.30 a.m. Just 12 minutes later, the two left after Rossman was punched by another student. Witnesses also say Rossman was helping Lauren walk. It's not clear how drunk she may have been, or if she had taken drugs, or been slipped something without her knowledge. Later, Lauren is seen on surveillance video at roughly 3 a.m. According to Rossman and Beth, she ended up in the apartment the men shared. They claim they tried to get her to stay and sleep on the couch, but she refused. At about 4.30 a.m., Rosenbaum, who lived in an apartment down the hall, says he watched Lauren, barefoot and without her cell phone, walking home alone. Her apartment was... I would think they would have called an ambulance. That's yeah, my own feeling about that. But then again, you know, is it the big kept secret that three boys are keeping a big major secret? I don't know. I don't know. That's why I say I'll leave everything open. I mean, as far as with the boyfriend, you know, he gave conflicting statements too. He's a suspect too. Everybody's a suspect, like I just what said. What were his conflicting statements? About him being home and all that. He's watching a basketball game. He said he was home watching a basketball game, correct? Yeah. Not the case? Put it this way, all the statements, and then everybody lawyers up, and I mean, it was only, I didn't get to interview them in the beginning, that would have been an important thing to interview them then, and get the sense of someone, someone's lying or not, or trying to cover something up, so I didn't have the affordability to interview them right after this happened, which I would have liked to. Well, what, what, what was he up to that morning? Because that was, that was a big part of it, is he claimed that he was planning there was a claim that he was planning to meet up with her that morning either I, it, it was unclear what time all i know is again and and she had lost her phone i i don't trust people who want to help but then all of a sudden subsequently retain attorneys to cover something or protect themselves. If you want to really find Lauren, you wouldn't have lawyers there. You'd be cooperating with the law enforcement people and with every aspect, every bit you can to try to help find Lauren. And when people get lawyers, it makes me suspect that they're trying to cover something up. Is it the drug usage? I don't know. I don't think so because it's so prevalent there. Every kid's buying pot, cocaine, drinking pills. I mean, it's all over the place. So that, that really can't be the motive behind it. So, like I said, every one of them, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping again that even people watching this, that someone gets a conscience, someone who knows something, maybe 
one of the three boys, maybe the boyfriend, gets a get a conscience is living with this thing on their mind that they know what happened to Lauren and step forward to clear their conscience. Hey, we had one in uh, a murder case here in New York City. Guy killed somebody 12 years ago. The guy couldn't live with himself, and he came forward and said, "Look, I did this. It was an accident or whatever." And, you know, it could have certainly been an accident, too, that she passed. Do you believe that there's just some random person that walked up uh, during her short walk home? Wide open with that. Wide open with the fact that could it have been when she got to College Avenue, some local yokel there was passing by, sees a beautiful young girl there, and uh, all of a sudden, oh, let me give you a lift, get into the car. And, and I, Is that wide open? Absolutely. That's what I'm saying is, Nothing is eliminated. So, if if I was of, in all the stuff that you have gone at, um, it's interesting to me that you still keep that theory open. In other words, you you found nothing really to really. eliminate any of these kids. Right, and we have some pe bits of evidence I'm not going to talk about that we're analyzing as we're speaking right now with DNA to try to find out uh, certain things, and and uh, you know that can open up so another another direction. But I again. My theory is everything's on the table. Could it have been, you know, we checked that guy who's wanted for a couple of murders over there, uh, about two, three hundred miles away, and uh, that came out to be not nothing to do with it. We also had some other informations of some other colleges nearby that there were some people out there. Who's to say, too, is that you didn't have some local nuts there that knew if you go out on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday night, you were going to find some drunk gals walking in the street. You find someone at 2.30 in the morning, how easy it's going to be. You know she's going to be probably have drunk something, and, and uh, you know, that could be a theory. All these boys. Would it be just great if we had full cooperation from all the boys, no lawyers, full cooperation, take polygraphs, everybody, and eliminate them? Spear. We may finally be on the verge of answers in the five-year-long mystery, one that's gripped Indiana and really the entire nation. You're going to see it all in an extraordinary 2020 tonight, now just three hours away. ABC's Brian Ross and Brad Garrett spent the past year digging into old clues in Lauren's disappearance and uncovering new leads as well. One of them tracking down a former classmate of Lauren's who says he knows the people who did this. We're also getting our first look at part of that special tonight. Also in the mix, a flood of tips about the alleged involvement of current and former members of biker gangs. The Sons of Silence, so brutal. They were featured in this History Channel documentary as a new kind of mafia. Did you shoot her? No, I didn't shoot her. You didn't shoot her? You with her. I don't even know the broad. I told you that. Bye. And then, in the last few months, Garrett received a set of brand new leads from inside a state prison, claiming that some of her fellow students saw Lauren die and secretly disposed of her body. She OD'd. They got scared and drove her down to the Ohio River and disposed of her body. Let's bring in Brian Ross, Chief Investigative Correspondent for ABC News. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be here. What intrigued you about Lauren's case before you began to investigate? The fact that nobody seemed to be able to come forward and say what happened in that pivotal last few minutes uh, on June 3rd, 2011. She appeared to have just vanished off the face of the earth, and we know that couldn't have happened. No body and no significant leads. So former FBI agent Brad Garrett, now an ABC News consultant, about a year ago, took on the case. He joined with private detectives that the Spear family had hired and began to go over the leads that had been dismissed uh, by Bloomington police and developed new fascinating details and th Lauren Spears mother call this case a nightmare that you never wake up from and it has changed the way students view their personal safety don't like go anywhere like alone or just be with friends all the time be around people like you don't want like uh, bad things to happen to you those bad things actually happened to then 20 year old Lauren Spearer on June 3rd, 2011. After a night of partying, she was last seen at the corner of 11th Street and College Avenue. I would characterize this as an ongoing investigation for the Bloomington Police Department, just as it has from the very beginning. Um, the uh, statement that we would like to make clear is that uh, we have not and will not give up on determining the circumstances that led to Lauren's disappearance. On Facebook, Charlene Spearer posted 
posted this message. She had everything to live for. Someone took a life full of promise away from our daughter. That person continues to breathe the same air that Lauren should be breathing, living their life seemingly as if they have no responsibility for Lauren's disappearance. I trust that somehow, someday, someone will be held accountable. And obviously, I hope that um, some answers and some closure come to her family, and I think it would be really important for the IU community to get them. When news broke four years ago of a co-ed missing from IU, Lauren had lived in my building uh, when she was a freshman. John Summerlot, on vacation that week, joined the search. Like anybody else, I just showed up to volunteer that day. And the scene struck him. The sheer number of people. Hundreds of people fanned out to find sophomore Lauren Spear. She disappeared after a night partying with friends. Her phone, purse, and shoes left at a bar. John spent weeks trying to find her, eventually leading the volunteers. I've not found another case of a college student that had this sort of coverage of people looking, uh, people searching, people involved in the search. But four years later, Lauren is still missing. And though police suspect foul play, no one's been arrested. Yeah, that's a tough piece of it. For John, the search never ended. It actually marked a beginning of helping families beyond Bloomington. I got involved uh, shortly afterwards with search and rescue uh, and became a certified search and rescue instructor. And, and now he's the emergency management coordinator at IU. He literally wrote the book of current campus policies on how to look for a missing student, where to start, who to mobilize, what to check. When did they last log into their email? When was their ID card swiped? John shares that knowledge with colleges across the country. He's become the expert people turn to. The history before this was largely that universities were very hands-off uh, about a search. It's a law enforcement issue. Law enforcement will tell us what we can do. Because of Lauren, because of these searches, that changed. It's a partnership for many colleges now. And because of this one-time volunteer, it's a legacy from Lauren that's helping others. Filed by her parents. A federal appeals court says a judge in Indianapolis was correct to dismiss the lawsuit against those three men last known to have seen her the night of her disappearance. Her parents had sued Corey Rossman, Michael Beth, and Jay Rosenbaum, three men who were with Lauren the night of June 2nd, 2011, before she disappeared. The appeals court rejects the Spears' argument that the three had a legal duty to care for Lauren because of how intoxicated she was. The court also says Lauren's disappearance is not enough proof that she had been injured. Her parents have said they believe her to be dead, but her early in the ceremony, University President Michael McRobbie spoke briefly about the effect Lauren Spears' disappearance has had on the entire IU community. On this day, when we celebrate both the past accomplishments of our students and the promising future upon which they are about to embark, I ask that all of us also keep Lauren and members of her family in our thoughts. Everyone at the ceremony then observed a moment of silence for the young Hoosier student who disappeared nearly two years ago. I thought it was a really nice moment and that they took time to make a tribute, especially since she was part of our class, and I think they handled that very well. Graduate Mike Carter said he felt terrible for Lauren's parents. Having to see this day occur and them not being able to experience what other parents are experiencing, and my heart really goes out uh, to the Spear family. Female graduates did say they have learned a lesson from Spear's tragic story. It made a lot of people realize that you need to be smart about when you go out. And a lot of people think, oh, that's never going to happen to me. It was a scary thing, but um, you just, I, you can't like live in total fear. I still wanted to be able to have fun and just um, be mindful of that, you know. Martinsville home. Their focus, finding missing IU student Lauren Spear. Investigators searched the home and barn next to it, bringing in cadaver dogs and sifting through dirt and taking pictures inside the home. They also hauled away a white truck, which sources tell eyewitness news will be tested for DNA. According to property records, the home belongs to Lisa and Danny Walker. 35-year-old Justin Wagers, Lisa Walker's son, also lived here until his arrest last August for allegedly exposing himself to a girl in Johnson County. He's still in the Johnson County Jail. Wagers has been on Indiana's sex offender registry since 2007 after a 2005 conviction for vicarious sexual gratification. Relatives at today's search were visibly upset. I'm out of it. I don't know. I'm just here. So what's Justin to you? Uh, he's a 
step grandson, what you call it, and Danny's wife's son, yeah. yeah. That's Danny's wife's son? Yeah. Okay. Are you, is this upsetting for you? Huh? Is this upsetting for you today? Well, it wouldn't be for anybody. We'd had our experiences with with that family. Neighbors Jack and Glenda so Macer say they discovered so Wager's history after the couple says they caught Wagers peeping in their bedroom window four years ago. Well, I've got a security lamp out here, and so I said, hey, this is loud. Well, when I did that, he turned around and looked who it was. Well, I got a good picture of I got a good face of him. So then we went and back in the house and I went and got my gun because I didn't know if he was going out the back right into the front or what was going on, you know, kind of scary thing. Macer and his wife say they confronted Wager's mother who brought her son to their house. He told you I am a registered sex offender, sex but it exactly. wasn't me. Yeah, but it wasn't, uh, you did, it wasn't me. And I said, well, I'll tell you this. I said, if it wasn't you, he was your twin brother. I'll put it that way. And I said, I had good lighting on you, I seen you. And I told him, I said, you know, usually all of us out here have guns. And you know, you do something like that again, you might. And Matt, we speak with Justin Wager's grandfather this morning. You're going to hear from him in just a few moments. First, though, a note about this location here in Martinsville. This was the scene of that large investigation yesterday. As you can see, investigators have now left the scene. We just saw the property owners leave here a few moments ago. They did not stop to speak with the media or answer any questions. Now to that other location in Trafalgar. I spoke with Justin Wager's father and grandfather there this morning. Both acknowledge that Justin had some legal problems in the past, but also said they could not imagine he would be involved in Lauren Spears' disappearance. Justin's father showed us the property this morning and told us that the FBI and other law enforcement, along with cadaver dogs, were there yesterday for several hours. He said they searched the grounds and a trailer on the property, but he does not believe they found anything. Wager's grandfather sat down with us inside of his home. He has been watching the news since the story broke yesterday, but he does not believe his grandson is involved. I don't think that's in him. I don't think that he had anything to do with nothing like that. <laughs> I don't. I just don't believe he did. I, they uh, it just don't uh, just don't don't fit him. I mean, he was just too good a boy to. And Wager's attorney also says his client has nothing to do with Lauren Spears' case. This investigation, as you can imagine, has garnered national attention. Lauren's mom telling Eyewitness News that she wants to find Lauren more than anything. Yeah, Todd and Erica, we're currently standing along Old Morgantown Road. Unfortunately, there are no street lights out here, so it may be difficult to see. But the house in question we've been speaking about is right behind us. Tonight, the yard completely empty, but earlier today, this area was filled with investigators. Bloomington police, with the help of the FBI, raiding this home in Martinsville today after police received a tip in relation to the disappearance of IU student Lauren Spear. Now, FBI vehicles lined this road earlier today from aerials up above you could see those investigators combing through the yard cadaver dogs also brought in in this search a white pickup truck from this house also searched and then confiscated now they even sifted the area especially around and inside of a barn on this property the method very similar to what's typically done when investigators are searching for human remains but late tonight investigators confirming to us no remains have been found the property is now back in the hands of the owners. 35-year-old Justin Wagers, who currently is in the Johnson County Jail, was living here with his family prior to his most recent arrest. His family is still here. He is a registered sex offender accused of stalking and exposing women exposing himself to women. Now, his attorney has since sent us a statement tonight saying, in part, Mr. Wagers has no knowledge regarding the disappearance of Lauren Spear or any other missing person. The family has no further comment at this time and asks the media to respect the Herald Times, he suspects the man convicted of killing IU student Hannah Wilson is also connected to the disappearance of Lauren Spear. Wilson was killed in November of 2015. 
Daniel Messel was found guilty of murder in the case. Spear, also an IU student, was last seen in 2011 and is believed to be dead. RTV6 is reaching out to the prosecutor and Bloomington police to follow up on...